Hello and welcome back to Historical Terminology, uh, where today we're going to talk about Buddhism, which is the religion or faith that was founded by the original Buddha um, in India and has since become one of the largest religions in the world. Um, this video is going to be a little bit longer than some of our other historical terminology videos, but there's just so much to talk about when it comes to Buddhism. So bear with me as we talk about all of the important things going on with the Buddhism. Let's start. So what is Buddhism? Well, like I said, it was founded in India somewhere between the 6th and 4th century BC, and it was based on the original teachings of Gautama Buddha. I probably didn't say that right, and I apologize. Buddhism's goal is to overcome suffering caused by desire and ignorance of reality's true nature, and one can just transcend that individual self by attaining nirvana, which ends the cycle of life and death, which could also be thought of as reincarnation. Um, the founding of Buddhism, like I said, happened in India, and Buddha lived in a land with uh, suffering, and after realizing this, he went on what they call a noble quest to find liberation from the suffering. He managed to achieve enlightenment in his lifetime by following the middle way, and then his teachings were collected and retaught by his many followers after his death at 80. So um, Buddha did do all this teaching, and then, of course, his, his teachings were collected and then disseminated by his followers. Um, so he wasn't out actively like trying to spread this to other people. This is just what he taught the people around him. And then people really liked it and spread it afterwards. So here is um, the original Buddha, uh, Siddhartha Gautama. Um, and he renounced his extravagant lifestyle to become a teacher and monk. Um, and he discovered the, the mechanism that holds people in the cycle of life and death. And after his death, his teachings were collected. And he, that became the basis of Buddhism. And, and more has been added to it since but the basics are from him. So let's talk about what the major tenets of Buddhism are. Um, first of all, Buddhism doesn't really have a deity. Um, they don't follow a god necessarily. Uh, instead, they follow Buddha's teachings to try to break the cycle of reincarnation. There are supernatural figures, of course, who can help or hinder one's path to enlightenment, but they are not gods and they are called diva. So there's not like um, an all-powerful deity that's, that decides if you break your cycle of reincarnation. It's based on your individual actions. Um, Buddhists also believe in what are called the Four Noble Truths. And the Four Noble Truths are the realities of noble people or those who can reach enlightenment. Uh, the first one is that suffering is an innate characteristic of existence. So if you exist, you suffer. Two um, is the arising of suffering comes because of desire. So you have desires and that's what's causing your suffering. Three, you can end suffering by attaining um, or letting go of that desire. So by getting rid of your desires, you can end the suffering that you're in. And then finally, um, the eightfold path is the way to renounce your desire and end suffering. So there is a way to do it. And it's this eightfold path. And that's the basic Four Noble Truths of Buddhism. Let's talk about each one a little bit more specifically. Uh, the first truth is called uh, dukkha, and it was originally translated to mean suffering, uh, but lately has been left untranslated because this suffering can't be encapsulated um, by um, Western language. Um, and it's broken up into three categories. There's the suffering of suffering, which is like the physical and mental suffering of being alive. Um, there's the suffering of change when pleasant or happy experiences make one sad because those circumstances that led to that happiness stop happening. And then there's all pervasive suffering, which sounds pretty awful. Um, and that's just the conditional experience of being, of having like un, being unsatisfied with your existence. Um, like things don't measure up to your expectations. So there's different ways that you can suffer in your life. The second truth was the idea that suffering arises because of our desires or attachments. And so basically it's saying that um, our attachment to being alive makes it difficult to break the cycle of reincarnation because we want to come back and exist again. We want to be a part of this life, you know, because while we're living, this seems really important. Um, and a large part of Buddhism is trying to overcome these desires and attachments that hold us in that cycle. The third truth is just saying that we need to let go of those desires. Um, and so it's often done by meditating and freeing oneself from perception. 
Um, and that takes a long time to truly reach this state of having let oneself go. And then finally, the fourth truth is this path that one can take to reach enlightenment. Um, and the official one is called the Noble Eightfold Path. And it's just the accepted way of reaching enlightenment. Um, and it's deeply intertwined with this fourth truth. And so over the course of Buddhism's ex existence, there have been many different thinkers um, that have developed and pondered this path and maybe expanded on it or contracted it. Um, so it's changed over time a little bit. So here's the Noble Eightfold Path. And it is made up of eight practices that help lead people to enlightenment. Um, and they're the right view, the right resolve, the right speech, the right conduct, the right livelihood, the right effort, the right mindfulness, and the right meditation. And these eight practices are sometimes divided into three groups, which are moral virtue, meditation, and insight. So basically they're saying that there are three different major concepts that you can follow to reach enlightenment. And that's by having a strong moral virtue, having insight into the world and yourself, and then meditating. As I mentioned before, Buddhism also believes in the cycle of rebirth, uh, and that means that people are reincarnated. In Buddhism, this cycle is suffering due to attachments and desires, and therefore the goal is to break out of the cycle by reaching nirvana. In the Buddhist tradition, there are six realms of existence one can be reborn into. That means heavenly, demigod, human, animal, hungry ghost, and hellish. So there are different stages in which you could be reborn into based on how well you do in the, your current life. Liberation from the cycle is known as nirvana, and nirvana is described as a perfect state of quietude, freedom, and the highest form of happiness, um, as well as being liberated from suffering. Um, and Buddha is believed to have achieved this type of nirvana um, once before he died and once after he died. Um, liberation has been described as the extinguishment of the three poisons, greed, hate, and ignorance. So you're, you're no longer plagued by these things and you are liberated from suffering. Buddhists also believe that there is uh, no unchanging or permanent self or soul. And this means that no matter what any person can change over time, you're not stuck the way you are. You can change and you can be better. Um, and that's an essential part of this, right? If you um, work on yourself and you work on letting go of your attachments, um, you can improve and then of course reach enlightenment. So anybody's capable of doing this. Um, and they show this by proving that the five aggregates or components of personality are not absolute. And those are form, feeling, perception, formation, and consciousness. So basically they do kind of some meta thinking to say, hey, look, all these things are changeable. That means you're not set in stone, which is a pretty awesome way of thinking if you think about it. I think a lot of Western um, philosophies say that your your soul is set in stone, and so if you're bad, you're stuck being bad. Um, and so this way, anybody can improve and become better. So let's talk about some of the practices that Buddhists follow. Um, first of all, of course, Buddhists practice meditation, and it's a way for them to just let go of desire and stave off that kind of thing. I mean, the goal of meditation is to gain calm, undistracted, and a unified state of consciousness. Um, there's evidence that meditation was practiced before Buddha, um, but the texts are some of the first to have survived, so we know for sure that it happened during his time. Um, visualization is also helpful when they meditate, so sometimes some Buddhists use visualization to help meditate and create that calmness in themselves. They also practice restraint and renunciation, which is a process one goes through prior to meditating to kind of make it so you can truly free yourself. Um, and it's kind of a practice of learning to deprive your senses so that you can meditate more fully. Um, and it's just kind of a process of helping meditate better. You also have to learn the Dharma. Like any worldview, it's really important that you know all the different parts of the belief. And so in Buddhism, you have to learn the Dharma and the Buddha's teachings before you can become enlightened. Because if you don't know the teachings, then you can't possibly reach enlightenment. You also have to show devotion. Um, and devotion is usually ritualized in prayer, chanting, or pilgrimage. And so there's many different ways that Buddhists can show their devotion to the way of the Buddha. Um, 
and a devotion can be usually focused on some sort of image or location that they think of as spiritual. So you'll often see these Buddha statues where people go to pray when they are Buddhist. Um, and those are the places that they flock to to show devotion. The majority of Buddhists, in fact, I feel like I think all of them um, practice vegetarianism and they treat all life as sacred. Um, and so because of the reincarnation cycle, right, even animals are seen to have souls and be essential and important, so you shouldn't eat them. Um, the Buddha did not directly forbid eating meat, um, but he did say that the meat trade was unethical. And so early Buddhists ate meat because they were fed with gifts. And so it was impolite to turn down a gift, um, especially because that's all they got to eat. Um, and nowadays, though, um, they're vegetarian. Buddhists also follow a strict ethical code in their daily lives, um, especially having this kind of ties into like having the right speech, the right action and the right livelihood. Um, they're supposed to be doing the right thing, morally good things. Um, and they take what are called precepts and they live by the aid of others. And that's what helps them have ethical lives. They're not tied down to material goods because all that they have is given to them um, as a donation. So they don't have their own like personal property or anything like that. Um, and Buddhists also frequently give to charity and, and follow the tenets of having good will towards others. So they perform the acts of charity and, and help others in their time of need. Like any major faith, there is sects in Buddhism. Uh, the first major one is called Therav Theravada. I think that's how you say it. Um, and they are considered the most traditional of the Buddhist sects and they follow the Eightfold Path. Um, some, however, also follow the path that's laid out a little bit differently. Um, so clearly, right, that they have different interpretations of how to reach enlightenment. Um, Mahayana Buddhism is based on the principles of Bodhisatt Bodhisattva, and um, the group introduced the Ten Bhumi Doctrine, or the Ten Stages to Reach Awakening, and so they can't change things a little bit. They also emphasize the six paramitas or perfections that one has to accomplish. The perfection of giving, the perfection of morality, the perfection of patience, the perfection of vigor, the perfection of meditation, and the perfection of insight. So it's really boiling down those eightfold paths into these things that you need to work on until you get them just right. Finally, there's also Vajrayana Buddhism, and it's also known as Tantric Buddhism due to its association with the Tantra. And they differ by using mantras in their practice. So they, they add in this other aspect to their worship. Um, it's mostly practiced in Tibet, Mongolia, and the Himalayas, but it's also found elsewhere in East Asia and around the world. Um, and sometimes it's, it's called Tibetan Buddhism specifically because um, that's one of the most prominent places where it is. Let's talk a little bit about the spread of Buddhism and how it got all around the world. Um, after the king Asoka became the ruler of India, he sent missions to other kingdoms to spread the word of Buddha. He was, um, him and his family were publicly supporting Buddhism um, and they, because that was the practice, that's what they practiced themselves. And so they built these stupas and temples all over the place um, and they actively monetarily backed Buddhism and made it so that it could spread further along the way. Um, when India finally came in contact with the Silk Road, that connection accelerated Buddhism's expansion to other parts of Asia. And so monks would arrive in China and then Japan because of the Silk Road. Um, Buddhism also spread west to the Middle East through this, this process. Um, however, Buddhism did end up declining in the Middle East after the Islamic conquest in the seventh century. So the, the conquests that um, the Arabs did um, spreading Islam kind of wiped that slate clean in the Middle East. Modern Buddhism has its own issues, obviously. First of all, Buddhists have been persecuted in different countries. Um, like, uh, for instance, China has been cracking down on Tibet because they feel that Tibet is part of Chinese territory, whereas Tibet feels that it's an independent area. Um, Mongolia, Japan, the Khmer Rouge and Cambodia have all persecuted Buddhists in the 20th century. So Buddhists have not been immune to these kind of religious persecutions that other religions have faced. Um, and Buddhism was mostly has been persecuted for not aligning with communist values. 
um, and also just were not aligning with the nationalistic or imperialistic values of the nations that they find themselves in. Um, they're more worried about their spiritual enlightenment and not about the world um, around them, right? Because they're trying to break the cycle of enlightenment. They don't really care about this national stuff. Buddhism in the West um, was not really studied until the 19th century. And then an influx of Chinese and Japanese refugees kind of sparked this interest in this religion that they all followed. Um, and Buddhism popularity kind of rose again in the 60s as the counterculture um, in the United States kind of adopted the, the peace and love and self-reflection parts of Buddhism. Um, and it's often seen as like exotic and progressive because of some of the reasons that I've mentioned. Um, and um, even though it's kind of like the, the regular sort of thing in the East, like people have been raised on this. So it's just normal in, in, in Eastern cultures, whereas in the West, we don't really think that way. And so we see it as very exciting and new and different, even though it's older than most of our stuff. Um, there have also been neo-Buddhist movements, and that's uh, these attempts to modernize and change Buddhism for the modern times, right? The world has changed. We need to adapt with it. Um, and Navayana Buddhism is the most popular of these movements, um, and it emphasizes class struggle and social equality. So um, it kind of arose in India where there was a caste system, um, and it advocates for, um, for social justice and um, helping the poor and, and that kind of stuff. In Thailand and a few other countries, Buddhism has was changed or reformed by governments. So the governments would actually like kind of like made it like a state religion and they changed different parts of it. Um, and in other places, there have been more secular forms of Buddhism where they uh, adapt the ethics, um, but not necessarily the spiritual parts of Buddhism. Um, and just like every other religion, Buddhism has also been dealing with sexual abuse and misconduct. Um, Buddhism and its clergy have been accused of misconduct and abuse, and there are several high-profile cases uh, involving Tibetan Buddhists in the 80s and 90s. Um, although it's not been covered up as, as grandly as the Catholic Church has gone to cover up its abuse, um, there have been cases of cover-ups in the Buddhists, um, Buddhist religion as well. Regardless, Buddhism has had a large cultural influence. Um, it has had a huge impact on Eastern Asia, especially in China, Japan, and Korea, and the emphasis on kindness and respect for others comes from the Noble Eightfold Path. So basically, because Buddhism was so popular when these countries were becoming themselves, right, they were gaining their national identity, these, uh, these emphases from the Eightfold Path became kind of a part of their communal culture. Um, and after centuries of living with these ideals, these code of ethics is kind of just inside these societies, um, even though they don't necessarily trace it to that anymore, it's, it kind of originated from this thought process. Thank you so much for watching this historical terminology video. Please subscribe and leave comments so that I know what you're interested in learning about and I can make more videos to suit your interests. Thank you once again, and we'll see you soon.